details. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, settle down out there. <laughs> well, I'll give you a minute to, uh, to get your seats, find some seats, and, and we can get, get going. It's great to see that we have so many people here that uh, people are fighting over chairs. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lawrence Pintak, founding dean of the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication. It is always such a pleasure to be here at Symposium, to see the, the buzz, to see the excitement on the part of the alumni and on the part of the students. And, and I think today has been a, a great event. I've been popping in and out of various sessions. And uh, it's, it's been uh, wonderful to see the, uh, the amount of excitement and, and energy in the room and uh, to see how, how much expertise and, and experience uh, that our alumni bring to our students. So it's, it's always a great day. Um, welcome to the 41st Murrow Symposium, our evening of excellence. And there is so much excellence in this room, but we're going to, to uh, highlight just a little bit of that excellence that's particularly excellent. Uh, there's a uh, long-standing tradition with the symposium offering our students insight into the professions of tomorrow. And I really just, I can't thank all of you professionals. And can I just see the professionals, can you just stand up? Alumni and professionals who've come to, to help our students make that next step. Thank you so much. And I also, I know my, my, uh, our other dean, and, and we have a plethora of, I don't know how, what multiple deans, is that a coven of deans or a uh, cackle of deans? But we have two tonight. For those of you who don't know, I'm on my way out. I'm the outgoing dean. I've been dean for the last seven years. And I'm handing over the reins to Bruce Pinkleton, who is the, the incoming dean, Bruce, uh, who will be up here in a few minutes. So if you're confused as to why there's all these deans, that's, that's why. Um, every year, it is part of symposium is recognizing excellence. And each year, our Hall of Achievement uh, alumni select a new group of inductees. The nominees are individuals who've made significant contributions through their business, professional, or academic achievement, not financial. They, they didn't buy their way in. These are people who have credentials that have, have brought them to our, our attention. They've demonstrated their community involvement. They've shown support for the university and the college. And they're individuals who often, as many of you, mentor our students and help our young professionals move out into their fields. Most have received many other honors from their professions, from their communities, but we wanted to bestow our honor on them as well. And speaking of honor and excellence, to introduce our honorees, I take special pleasure in introducing Kay White, who is our Professional Advisory Board member and the uh, 2010 Hall of Achievement inductee and is the chair of our Hall of Achievement group. Okay? And, and for those of you who don't know, Kay is also our real world link to Edward R. Murrow. You know the old six degrees of separation to Kevin Bacon? Well, we have a one degree of separation to Murrow because Edward R. Murrow, when he came to campus to give his, his uh, commencement address, met Kay and plucked Kay out of WSU, brought her to New York, found her a job as, as assistant to the head of CBS at the time, and she then worked her way up through the ranks to become the first <laughs> down through the ranks to become the first female vice president at CBS. That's quite a quite an achievement. Thank you. Thank you very very much, Dean Pintat, and thanks to all of you for coming and joining us today for this uh, celebration to recognize 
uh, some of the best of the best. I would like to start by thanking Sherry Neville, Carol Kowalski, Camille Pereski, and Dina Penton for their advice, counsel, and assistance with the selection of this year's honorees. One of the highest accolades one can receive is to be selected by your peers to stand with the greats who have gone before. It gives me great pleasure to recognize this year's class of 2016 Murrow Hall of Achievement members. Some of you have heard this saying before, but I'm gonna repeat it again. Ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. And ability determines how well you do it. I'm pleased to introduce to you today three people who have done it exceedingly well. Our first inductee is Sherry Brennan. Sherry is a 1972 graduate at WSU. She is marking her 26th year as an independent marketing public relations consultant who founded her own company, Alliance Communications. Sherry had not yet graduated from WSU when she was offered a position at an advertising agency in San Francisco and needed to finish her coursework while on the job. I'm not sure many of us could do that. In the mid-70s, she returned to Washington to work initially with the Seattle Chamber of Commerce, a memorable a memorable position at the time when the city worked to acquire the Seattle Seahawks and the Seattle Mariners baseball team. Throughout her career, Sherry has believed in giving back and lifelong learning. She has served as president of three professional associations and has been a longtime volunteer with various community, golf industry, and youth-focused organizations and of course, WSU. Please join me in congratulating this year's Murrow Hall of Achievement inductee, Sherry Brennan. And Darren's gonna help me out here by handing off my notes. You'll find out why I wasn't a broadcast major. Um, but as Kay said, I, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my community involvement because it's been an important part of me and the pro bono part of what I do professionally um, is some of the work I'm most proud of. So with that, I'm gonna just roll into, um, from a solo's perspective on community involvement. And, and uh, these are some of the causes and things I care about. They've come from clients, they've come from family, they've come from um, my own, interests and passions. Obviously, you'll see the bookends with WSU on there, which is a very integral part of what I do. And it really started with the kazoo. I, one of my most memorable classes here at WSU was a COM 400 level where we had to develop a campaign, and our group chose the uh, kazoo. And, and for me, that, that left a, an indelible impression because we learned to work as a team, we learned about messaging, and there were just a lot of things that I've uh, kind of stayed with. And I look back on the coursework today and kind of the courses I took then, and there's a lot of similarities. The, the vernacular has changed. I think public relations is now strategic communication and, and other things. But those were the tools I left with, and I, I can say I use all of them still today in the work that I do. Um, my adventures began, as Kay said, when um, the week I was graduating, uh, m minus one, one, one three-hour credit. Um, I did get a job offer at an ad agency in San Francisco, so I grew up in Kirkland, so to go from Kirkland to Pullman to San Francisco was really quite the adventure, and, and I've had some mentees ask about, I don't know that I want to go too far from home, and I say, Pack your bags and go for it, because I've never looked back and regretted that decision. Although I did um, return to my roots as a native uh, Washingtonian, I uh, came back and was fortunate to land a position at the Seattle Chamber. And as Kay said, um, had some great experiences. A lot of what I did there was event planning. Uh, one of the ones that I remember was when 
President Ford and Secretary of State Kissinger came to town and I had to get Secret Service clearance because I was the staff photographer. And I really worried about that because while I was at WSU, I took part in some of the student demonstrations. Remember Vietnam and that? And I thought, they're going to find those photos. I'm never going to get credentialed, but I got my badge. <laughs> I think I kept it. It wasn't that official looking, but uh, there it was. So, And then as she said, um, I was fortunate to be at the chamber when the when the city got its franchises for the Mariners and the Seahawks, and we did big civic welcomes and got to go behind the scenes on a lot of that, and so that was very memorable. But in, in a session this morning, Marcia mentioned uh, DNA, and, and community involvement is in my DNA. My parents were very involved in everything about Kirkland. Dad helped build the ball field and the pool. Mom was real involved in um, everything from PTA and Little League and all of that. So it, it instilled in me at an early age the importance of giving back. But as I mentioned, um, I credit family, friends, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and colleagues for um, a lot of what I do. Some of it has been client, the paid, the bills, that, that helps pay the bills, but a lot of it has been pro bono. My brother volunteered me for a, um, an effort to send care packages to our troops in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and I can testify to the power of PR. This was a little community group that sent about 200 boxes one year, and, and when I got involved, and I'm not taking sole credit, but we used PR to get the message out, and we went from a few hundred to, over the course of six years, 70,000 packages. That, so it's, uh, the PR worked. It was very grassroots. We had no budget, but we got donations, we got volunteers, and uh, it was pretty magical. And then a client had asked me um, if I would work on the first tee and help them with some uh, PR when Seattle got its chapter. And 13 or 14 years later, I'm still uh, involved with it. It's a great program. If you're not familiar with it, it's a junior golf program, but they instill nine core values. And it's just fabulous to see. I'm having uh, lunch in a couple weeks with uh, a gal who uh, was nine years old when I first met her and uh, she's on her way to medical school, you know. Those things really um, kind of bring tears to my eyes. Golf's been an important part of it, and that was all client-driven. I took golf as a PE when I was here at WSU and um, <clears throat> never played until I started working with a golf course developer and then took the game up again so I could walk the talk, lifelong learning, even if it's golf, it, it worked. But I'm involved in a women's golf association. We're trying to get more women involved in in golf and using golf in your business and professional lives. So the foundation um, for EWGA wrote a chapter. So now I can claim I'm an author because I got to write one of the chapters in the book. So I got another line on my resume. Uh, my husband, who is a third generation Husky, um, <laughs> volunteered me for um, a project that uh, came through his Rotary Club. And we're in our ninth year. If you're in Seattle and love music, come to 10 Grands. It's a, uh, benefit for music education for K-12, because the schools are cutting the arts from a lot of their curriculum. Um, so lots of great memories with that. And then um, WSU is, all, I always find ways to work WSU into uh, conversations or my work. And if you've ever gone to the uh, Viticulture and Enology picnic that's now part of the auction of Washington Wines, they do a cork chipping contest, and I brought that to them uh, to combine uh, golf and some fundraising, and, and that's been a fun part of that. I always leave money behind at that event. Um, so Murrow has been um, just a fabulous part of my life. I mentioned all the, all the skills, and, and yeah, we won some awards along the way, but um, I have to say this one gets top spot on the shelf. It is um, really special to be in this, at the same table and and in the same photos with Tom and John. And my story about Tom is I've only been fired once in my career. And a cl a, my client wooed him away from a really nice job he had at one of the four or five star hotels. And I no sooner wrote the news release about him being named general manager that he decided to bring in his own team. So off I went and off I go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Q.
Cue the ding. I'm especially pleased to present uh, uh, the next Hall of Achievement Award to John Davis. Because when I called, when he finally answered the call and returned the call, uh, which is a story in itself, um, we got to chatting and I found out that we, share, we shared the same WSU mentors, Hugh Rundle, Cal Watson, and Bob Mott, uh, names that I trust many of you have heard. John Davis graduated from WSU in 1970 and worked in television stations in Fresno and Portland before landing a job as a television anchor and reporter at WBBM-TV in Chicago, where he would stay for the next 21 years. Along the way, he has won many honors, such as the Chicago Regional Emmy Award for his coverage of Chicago Mayor Harold Washington's death. Davis became the first U.S. reporter to interview Nelson Mandela just hours after his release from a South African prison. Pretty impressive. In 2003, he changed careers and started John E. Davis Communications, a firm that services politicians, corporate executives, celebrities, and athletes by providing high-end political consulting, media crisis management, and public speaking coaching. Through his media company, Davis has worked on numerous political campaigns. He's also recognized as a civic leader, serving on a number of volunteer boards and programs, such as We Care, a model program of the Chicago Public Schools. And he was instrumental in building a much needed hospital in Ghana, West Africa. Please join me in congratulating this year's Murrow Hall of Achievement inductee, John Davis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as she says, and of course, as Sherry said and Tom will say, we have all been the beneficiaries of so many awards recognized for some things I guess that we thought at the time were very significant. But I can't tell you how overwhelmed I am um, with receiving recognition from this group of peers, uh, from the Morrow School, from this university, uh, that nurtured everything that I was to become. I'm grateful to the Morrow Professional Advisory Board for recognizing me for, for this award, first and foremost, and involving me, which is even more important to me, in this symposium. I mean, I've had probably two of the, the greatest days of my life just interacting, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm serious. I want you to understand how significant this is to me, to be able to interact and have some small measure of influence, perhaps, on some young people who are going to be the giants in our industry tomorrow. I was very pleased to interview and talk with Nelson Mandela, more than interview him, talk with Nelson Mandela. Uh, but I grew up in a home in Texas where my mother and father were domestics. They cleaned the houses of very wealthy oil and cattle people. My father chauffeured. Um, but my mother and father always told us to be nice to the people who bring the service. Oh, you'll get to meet the kings and the queens but you'll get to meet them in fine fashion by being nice to the people who bring the service. I never would have gotten close to Nelson Mandela had it not been for the bus boys, the shoeshine men, uh, the bell boys at the Carlton Hotel in Johannesburg, South Africa, who alerted me even before CBS's bureau in, 
in Johannesburg with Larry Doyle as a bureau chief had even, well, there had been rumors that he was getting out, but little Jacob, the bellman at the Carlton Hotel, said, Comrade Davis, you must get down to Cape Town immediately. I said, why? He said, the old man's getting out. I said, the old man? I said, come on, Jacob, that, everybody's heard that for weeks. But I'm telling you, must go now. And we went. Doyle says to me, why do you want to leave now? I said, well, I just got it on good authority. From whom? And I was so embarrassed to say I got it from Jacob, the bellboy at the Carlton Hotel. So I said it, I had it on good authority. <laughs> and so my camera crew and I went. And lo and behold, they were right. And we got there ahead of the media horde that was uh, looking to document Mandela's release after 27 years. But I want you to understand that whatever I have achieved in my professional career, again, it began right here at Washington State University. My very family would not even exist were not for Washington State University. Without my learning, living, and loving right here at Wazoo. I met my wife, Maria, who had come all the way from Europe to come to school here. We married here. We had our first child, who is an attorney in Los Angeles now, Simone, here. And uh, we all grew day by day in this wonderful, wonderful footprint of caring and concern. I thank my wife, Maria. I thank the Cougar football team and its administration for enticing me to come to Washington State University. And as Kay had mentioned, I, I just love myself some Jim Dunn. <laughs> Jim Dunn would say to me, Johnny Davis, tell me a good story. And I just, well, what is a good story, Prof? I mean, what's a good story? And I remembered my grandfather was a great storyteller. He had a smokehouse, and we would sit there on a, on a stump that he had cut from a, a tree trunk, and we would watch meat cure, and he would tell me these great stories. So I, I did, in the recesses of my mind, always had a good story to tell Jim Dunn. Thank all of those professors in Cal Watson, Hugh Rundle, they realized my potential, obviously, long before I became a, a journalist. But they nurtured that seed inside of me. And they made me and put me on the path for this success. They convinced me that, that certainly I had a voice. You got a great voice. You had the other tools to succeed, they say, in radio or television. But the most important thing they said about talking, Johnny Davis, is listening. Be a good listener. And I think that I have become a pretty good listener. But I thank God for the many opportunities in my professional career and that has taken me literally around the world to glean a storehouse of human experiences. And I want to thank Kay White for her cougar determination <laughs> to reach out to me despite my refusal to answer her call <laughs> because I thought she was just another out-of-town solicitor. <laughs> but she wasn't. She is now a very, very dear friend of mine. And Kay, I thank you very much. And I thank you all for this, reward, this award. And I thank you for this opportunity to appear before you in this hallowed place.
Tom Norwalk graduated from Washington State University in 1976, and he began his career in catering and banquet, the catering and banquet division of the Washington Plaza Hotel in Seattle. Today, he serves as president and CEO of Visit Seattle, a private nonprofit marketing organization that promotes Seattle as a top destination for travel and meetings and conventions. He is a hospitality veteran with extensive hotel and travel experience. His journeys include everything from national brands such as Weston and Four Seasons to local industries, organizations such as Seattle Hospitality Group and the Golf Club at Newcastle. Tom Norwalk is also known for his leadership outside the boardroom, chairing regional efforts of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the 2018 Olympics USA National Games Board of Directors, and is the former director for Seattle's Fifth Avenue Theater. Please join me in congratulating this year's Merle Hall of Achievement inductee, Tom Norwalk. Thank you, Kay, so much, and thank you for not booing because I fired Sherry. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, John and Kay, John and Sherry, uh, thanks for allowing me to bat cleanup. I think they did this by age, so just kidding. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm honored. I'm humbled to be here. Uh, and back at a school, the only school I really wanted to go to, and it was WSU. I grew up in Seattle, literally in the shadow of Husky Stadium, and I wanted to come to WSU. I can't believe the incredible road and path that that has afforded me and my family. But my parents and family were not so sure about my choice of school locations. They weren't very excited that I was coming over to Pullman. I think I remember them telling their friends and neighbors that their son had decided to go to a small liberal arts college in the East, and that's all they said. <laughs> and my enrollment process wasn't the easiest. I grew up with a grandfather in the travel business. And at one point, many, many years ago in Montana, he was made an honorary Blackfoot Indian chief. He used to take train travels through the Montana, Wyoming. And so when I applied at WSU, I checked the box that said I was a Blackfoot Indian, Native American. When my mom got a call a few weeks later, the school had offered me a scholarship and she freaked out. She couldn't believe that I would do that first, and I didn't know. And uh, so now the deans are wondering, how did this guy get an award? Uh, <laughs> how did he get in? I loved every minute of my WSU experience. I had a fun, short-lived radio sales career for KUGR, selling uh, local retailers. The highlight of that was offering a pizza company a major sweepstakes promotion where the 10th caller to call in would win pizzas. The phones never rang. So we had to figure out how to ad lib and give away pizza. I studied advertising as my main sequence, and I relished learning from a crusty advertising professor, Ed Bannister, that was here. Something that Ed taught me that I still use today was that no piece of work, no creative effort, no commercial, no production is done without a creative copy platform. Five, six, seven, eight key questions that if you can't answer, then no one's going to get the work done. One of those things was what really is the unique selling proposition of this product or service? The USP. And as I heard this afternoon with so many students, when you're looking at your brand, when you're looking at your resume, when you're interviewing and competing, or as I'm competing for business to come to Seattle, I still fall back on what really is that unique selling proposition. Only because of WSU I was able to get out uh, and get a job with a great local hotel company. It was because of the well-deserved Cougar work ethic that I've also heard a lot about today and I've seen today in action. We have an incredible reputation at this university pr for producing students that are realistic, that work hard, that roll up their sleeves, and that served me well. 
For over 25 years, I applied that work ethic, and I tried to add value to a, a small, growing luxury hotel company in Seattle, in San Francisco, and in Vancouver, BC. And for the past 15 years, I've found myself in an incredible career change, but all related in destination marketing. And I'm very lucky to be selling my hometown of Seattle. The destination marketing world is a really fun intersection of travel and tourism promotion, brand development, strategic communications, advertising, and certainly always selling, but also more than ever now, the necessary advocacy for the power and the benefit of travel. Unfortunately, many people in power in Washington, D.C. and around the country find travel to be frivolous and non-essential. And we know that's really not true. Travel's a $2 trillion industry. It supports 15 million people around the country. And it is so fun and so competitive and changing all the time. Everything has changed in the last 10 years. Uh, the rise of the web, of search, online travel agents, how we sell, what we do to compete. But it really is face-to-face. -face. It's cultural. It's that cultural ability to meet people and know people. Never before has there been a need for your excellence as students and your skills coming out of this great institution. The work ethic to help us promote, but also fight for the benefits of travel. I hope that it's a story you might want to tell one of these days as you're out working. I hope it's a story you will embrace. Your skills will lend yourself so incredibly well to the changing travel landscape. So thank you, Merle College, thank you, WSU, for providing me and my family a lifetime of opportunities. I'm very appreciative. I would like to conclude with the following observation, and it's something that I uh, believe in and think to be true. Never mistake knowledge for wisdom. One helps you make a living, the other helps you make a life. And with that, please join me in congratulating and celebrating this year's 2016 Class uh, Hall of Achievement <laughs> awardees. Hey everyone, I just want to let you know how uh, excited I am to be here. I have to be honest, if you circulated among the rooms today, I saw rooms literally standing room and sitting room only in some cases. It just about gave me goosebumps. I was just so excited. I'm so, um, so pleased to have so many qualified professionals here, so many alums willing to come back. Pullman can be a journey to get here, and it's worth the trek, and I just want you to know how much I appreciate that. I heard from so many students who are so excited about um, about the fact that they were rubbing elbows with, with qualified professionals, making contacts, and um, frankly, potentially finding job offers somewhere down the line as well. So thank you very, very much. Just very, very pleased about this, very excited. One of the things that is true of uh, Murrow grads is they continue to make a mark around the world. And one of our own grads has just received some recent awards. Is um, Anna King here by any chance? I don't know that she is. I suspect she's out working, frankly. Uh, Anna is a 2000 graduate of the Murrow College. If you listen to Northwest Public Radio at all, you will become a fan very quickly because you'll hear her work. It's outstanding. She recently won two Gracie Awards, and uh, WSU selected her as its Woman of the Year Award. It was an event that I was here at, privileged to sit uh, with her family, President Bernardo, and it was just a wonderful ceremony. The room was full, and she received a standing ovation. I wonder if you'd just join me in giving her a round of applause. Thank you very much. I, um, this next award goes to uh, uh, someone who is, in some respects, a mentor to me. I actually begged to offer this award, pretty much, and I had to twist a few arms to get her, I think, but um, 
Tom Huterman has, uh, when I came to WSU, I'm gonna go off script here, so don't hate me, but when I came to, to WSU in 1993, Tom Huterman had been teaching journalism here longer than I had been alive. I know you look at me, and I had brown hair, and uh, I had hair, actually, so. <laughs> and you're saying, Bruce is older than dirt, how is that possible? But it was possible. And, uh, you know, as I reflected back on that a little bit, I was, I was really stunned when I thought about the, um, the dedication, the desire, uh, the excellence that, that he um, personified in all those years of teaching. It really is a remarkable, remarkable record that, that he left here at WSU. I, uh, I was walking down the hallway once uh, outside of Tom's office. There were two students, and they were sitting outside Tom's office, and they were having a conversation about Tom. Tom doesn't know this story, so surprise. But um, they were discussing Tom, and some of the terms weren't terribly flattering, frankly. And uh, it was uh, really about how hard he was, basically. That was the bottom line, what a taskmaster he was how he was forcing them to work so incredibly hard, keeping up their lines, and, uh, and all these kinds of things. And uh, as I thought about that, I, I realized that uh, it actually impacted me. Tom was receiving a compliment that, uh, that very few of us receive who teach, basically. What they were really saying was Tom cared enough to make them learn, basically, to learn the fundamentals, to learn the craft of journalism, and to learn it well. And uh, I would bet money that they would thank him profusely today in their careers uh, for the, the skills that he taught them at a fundamental level clear back in 1993. So, um, I have a few quotes I want to read from, uh, from some of Tom's students. One is uh, Pat Kierher, who writes that uh, Tom was his best and toughest professor who brought a boots on the ground element to the classroom. If you're a journalism student, you probably had that one or those one or two professors who really worked you hard, who made you learn the craft, who taught you the difference between journalism and English, and you sweated it out a little bit. Uh, I'm sure I got an F for a misspelled proper noun or two myself. And, uh, and that was Tom, that was Tom. So it's tremendous. Uh, for my, my current students, I wanna read you a quote, and I'm not gonna tell you who this is from, I want you to guess, okay? So this is what this person wrote. I was terrified but determined not to squander the opportunity you offered. Any hints yet? Of course not. 31 years later, I still teach the beginning writing class. I believe teaching is the opportunity of a lifetime. Who wrote that? Roberta Kelly, you're exactly right. Can you imagine that? Is that not fantastic, right? So Tom passed down a tremendous craft to Roberta. She's still teaching students that way. I have to tell you, when I was head of the public relations degree program, I read a lot of internship reports. 15 years, I read those internship reports. Roberta's class was a class consistently mentioned as the most important class students had in preparing for their careers because of the incredible uh, writing skills that they obtained as a result of that class. That really is a craft passed down from Tom through Roberta to our students still today. So fantastic opportunity. Uh, fitting in the spirit of, of Murrow and of, of uh, honoring Tom, a former student of his, Dave Galatly, uh, chose to honor Tom with an award. So uh, it is, in fact, the Thomas H. Huterman Journalism Excellence Award, and I'm uh, very excited about it. It's been down in Tom's name. Dave and Tom, would you come up, please, just for a moment? Concerning Sandy and Dave Galatly's funding of the Student Excellence Award, I'm certainly glad I gave Dave good grades in those two classes. <laughs> Dave is not like another WSU alum, Tom alum, uh, uh, Jim Moore, who first wrote in the Seattle PI that Tom Huterman flunked me. <laughs> and later when he was on sports radio, uh, Jim told the Puget Sound again that Tom Huterman flunked me. <laughs> well, he had company. I was uh, once on uh, hiking on uh, uh, North Cascades and uh, met a former student, 
And he said, you flunked me. <laughs> um, another time, I was on the Port Townsend Ferry and met a former student. And the student said, you flunked me. <laughs> um, and I was on uh, Erie, Mount Erie on Deception Pass and ran into a former student of mine who said, you flunked me. Uh, the second lady I met yesterday at the Alumni Center came up to me, shook my hand, and said, you flunked me. <laughs> and here I thought all that was over. Uh, but at least Pat Carraher wrote nicer things about me in, in the WSU magazine. And I appreciate that. I greatly appreciate Sandy's and Dave's gift in my name. When Dave called me last Christmas and <clears throat> asked me all those questions, I just assumed that someone was getting a head start on my obituary. <laughs> I, I must also acknowledge the work of those who made this recognition possible, including Dean Pintak, Bruce, Bruce, uh, Dean Bruce, Carol Kowalski, and our assigned host, uh, Roberta Kelly. And I appreciate the freedom <clears throat> Alex Tan offered in my last years of teaching, allowing me to pursue my teaching and research interests. Being a Coug fan is certainly infectious. My immediate family holds nine degrees from WSU. And we won't mention where my master's degree is from. <laughs> and now my wife, Terry, who I married two years after Gretchen died, became an instant WSU fan. She had to. In my lifetime, I've received, as John said, uh, many uh, plaques, certificates, and awards. But this recognition is the most meaningful because it's <clears throat> given by the WSU family. I'll close with a, a pertinent story. My favorite class was the upper level public affairs reporting course. The students had to turn in a major story every two weeks. The topics with copies going to the Evergreen included budget, investigative, and trend stories. And later on, the students had to give evidence of uh, having used the internet. One semester, the quality of the writing fell and fell. I wrote rewrite on each story and handed them all back. I think that students would have rather had an F than deal with those stories again. Do you think your work would be acceptable at Stanford, I asked? No. Um, at Berkeley? No. At USC? No. Then what is it about WSU that you expected to pass your work off here, but you yourselves recognized it wasn't good enough to be accepted elsewhere? I knew what had happened. They had all become so involved with the Evergreen, the classwork uh, was, had suffered, and I understood, because I had myself had been a, the Evergreen editor in the fall of my senior year. But the challenge, all in the class did rewrite the, uh, rising to this challenge, they all rewrote their stories to the level that I know that they could achieve. The three points to this story. Today's recognition mentions my high standards and journalistic objectivity. Those traits are grounded in my four summer newspaper internships during college, campus work including the Evergreen and Stringing for the Spokane Chronicle, uh, and eight years of professional reporting at the Yakima Dailies. And then my writing skills were further sharpened by Dave Stratton in the history department as I worked on my dissertation. There I was, teaching all those students how to write better. And Dave was just ripping the stuffings out of my, <laughs> what I turned into him. But this brought me to the conclusion that we all need good editors. Secondly, our emphasis on writing meant that our students were ready to go to work the day they were hired. And of course, this was true of Glenn Johnson's students in broadcasting and those in the other sequences. 
Finally, our emphasis on quality meant that communication maintained uh, its reputation as the place to enroll in the state, not only in the early days, but after we had added the master's program as well. So thank you, Sandy and David, for recognizing what we were trying to do in communication and so generously supporting that effort. Dave is going to come up and say a few words, and then we'll take pictures. I guess I didn't realize how dang lucky I was to get a passing grade out of those courses. Um, it's even been rumored that uh, then Professor Huderman never gave an A. I know he never gave me one, that's for sure. So actually, um, Tom talked about uh, an article that Pat Karaher wrote, and I, and I want to read you one brief paragraph. It says, Huderman brought the boots to the ground element to the classroom, and um, at the time he was at the Yakima Herald Republic as a cub reporter. The paper sent him to the Yakima Proving Grounds where the war movie To Hell and Back was being shot. The movie starring Audie Murphy was a follow-up to his autobiography of the same title. The young reporter concluded his lengthy interview by asking Murphy, did you ever serve in the Army? <laughs> Murphy, of course, was the most decorated American combat soldier of World War II. <laughs> I met Terry Huterman last evening at the reception for the first time, and about the first thing she said to me is, why did you do this? Well, at the time that I was at Washington State, and for some years after working in the reporting business, I didn't really understand the value of what I had learned in Professor Huterman's classes. Later, as I transitioned into a family business that's unrelated, um, and I got to thinking about it, and I said, you know, he was tough. In fact, he was um, very meticulous as well, because I got lazy one week, and my, my 30 lines was 30 lines, but the margins were about that wide on each side. <laughs> when I got it back, there was a red line here and a red line there, and he gave me credit for 15 lines. <laughs> So some words to describe this gentleman and what he was trying to impart on us. And accuracy, timeliness, relevance, fairness, completeness, objectiveness. And while he was tough, he got the point across. And at the same time, he was a very compassionate gentleman to his students. And it's my wife and I's honor to um, start the process of, of this award that's going to provide some scholarship funding for students in the future. <laughs> we have a little memorabilia here for you. This was actually put together by uh, Camille Perizelski of the Development uh, Department, and it starts out with uh, the Tom Huterman who was in college, and there's a variety of information in here about your life at Washington State University. There's also some really great letters from some of your former students. So we want you to have that as a memory of this day. Thank you. Okay. Now to introduce our uh, keynote speaker tonight, uh, David Horsey, I would like to introduce the introduction person, <laughs> Bruce Amundsen, the vice chair of the Murrow Professional Advisory Board. Bruce. Thank you, Dean Pintak. I first became aware of David Horsey when I was the editor or excuse me, when I was working on the Evergreen, and we would 
page through the various publications that we get from college campuses. Now, this is before the days of the Internet, so we had no way of knowing what someone else was doing other than once a week we would get a pile of papers and uh, we could sit there and go through that last week's uh, publication. One of those was the University of Washington Daily. And as I looked through the Daily, I kept seeing these incredible political cartoons. They seemed to capture the issues and the life of college students like I'd never seen before. So when I became editor of the Evergreen in the fall of my senior year, one of the first things I did was call our cartoonist into my office to lay out my expectations for him for the coming semester. I got some of these dailies out, I laid them on my desk, and I said emphatically, I want you to draw like this and I pointed at Dave's cartoons. Now, I've said some dumb things in my life. That was probably the stupidest. <laughs> <coughs> there, that request was a little bit like asking the band that plays at your high school dance to sound like the Beatles. There are just some people who are so talented and so original they can be copied, but their creative genius cannot be matched, and that is David Horsey. A few years later, I actually got the chance to learn this firsthand when I had the pleasure of working with David at the Journal American in Bellevue. Whether it was drawing biting political cartoons or developing a caricature for a young fledgling sports writer, that would be me, David displayed a flair unmatched by his peers. What was even more amazing was the ease at which he developed these ideas and drew them. A few years later, at, on the JA, Dave and I went our separate ways. I went off to join the corporate public relations world while he went off to the Seattle, Seattle PI, excuse me, I almost did it, Seattle PI, where he won two Pulitzers for his editorial cartoons. Now, winning a single Pulitzer is quite a feat, let alone two. But a testament to the creative talent of David is that he achieved this feat by doing that out of the spotlight of New York or other ma larger media markets. And while he was courted by the big publications, David always felt a strong connection to his hometown of Seattle and kept his talents at the PI. It was only after the unfortunate demise of the PI that he was lured away from Seattle. He's now taken his talents to the Los Angeles Times where he continues to produce thought-provoking insights on political and social issues through his drawings and columns. Throughout his career, political issues have provided most of the fodder for David's cartoons. Whether it was Richard Nixon's White Watergate or Bill Clinton's sexual adventures, our political leaders have kept Dave's pen and wit busy for more than 40 years. I doubt, however, that anything has prepared him for the current pre presidential campaign. <laughs> No race in history, at least recent history, has produced so many colorful and varied candidates as this year. Nor has any can campaign so shaken the power structures of both political parties. It is a campaign that is calling into question the role of traditional media as social media plays an increasingly bigger and perhaps even more important role in energizing voters. It's therefore timely that this year's Murrow Symposium keynote speaker is someone who can not only shed some interesting insights into the campaign, but also help us contemplate the role of media in this, in this election and its future in the political process. Oh, and I think we're gonna have some laughs along the way. It is therefore my privilege to introduce and welcome to the stage this year's Murrow Symposium keynote speaker, David Horsey. Well, thank, thank you, Bruce. That, that introduction had the virtue of being, having a little bit of truth in it. And, and luckily, did not, he did not share many of the stories he could have about our time as long-haired troublemakers at the Journal American. I know that's odd to think of Bruce as a long, he did have long hair. <laughs> um, 
And I, I wanted to uh, also congratulate Sherry and Tom and John and Tom. Uh, you certainly deserve these honors. Um, this morning, I, I, had, I, I faced a dilemma. I, I, when I packed come here, I just kind of threw uh, some uh, ties into my suitcase, and I pulled out two of them this morning, and one of them was purple, <laughs> and one was crimson, <laughs> and uh, I had to think of my, my father, who was... Uh, the first in his family to go to college, and he went to Washington State University, uh, studied music, earned his bachelor de degree and master's here, and always was just a proud cougar. And uh, he was also a proud member of the um, Alpha Kappa Lambda fraternity, um, too. And, and one year, he, he took a, a young woman he had met in a little town north of here, Fairfield, took her to, uh, on their first date, to a dance at the fraternity, and it all worked out. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today, so I thank WSU for my actual existence. <laughs> and uh, also my uncle, I, I just remembered this, my uncle was a, a, a journalism student here and uh, went on to be the news director at KHQ and then went to Phoenix, worked in TV, and. Uh, so it, it's okay, I know I'm a husky, but I, I, I decided I would wear this today in, in honor of my uh, mom and dad and uncle. Um, so the, the, the title of my talk here may be a little curious to, especially the younger people there, that word is not lead, it's lead, from hot lead to tweets. Um, I've... <laughs> I can't believe how long I've been in this business. It's ridiculous. But my, my first real job at a real newspaper was my, after my freshman year in college, I worked in the art department at the Seattle Times. And in those days, the stuff I did got printed using melted lead, which seems bizarre now. Uh, and I can't even describe to young people how that, how that worked any better than I can describe how tweet works. Tweets work, or, but the fact is now, you know, my cartoons have gone from being made in hot lead to now they're made in, I guess, light. I don't even know what it is. But you can see them on your phone. Uh, you can, you know, it's all another kind of magic. And so what I want to talk about um, is th th there's sort of three aspects that kind of blend together here. Um, one is how technology has changed my job and, and the world of journalism, and also how it's changed politics a bit, and uh, even in this current election, uh, the effect it's had. And, and just for the benefit of you students, I'm also gonna kinda tell a little bit of my life story or my career story starting from when I was a student. So um, I think it'll all make sense, I don't know. But I hope it'll be fun. So and, and as long as I can figure out the right direction to to, uh, there we go, all right. So this is a, a, a cartoon, uh, actually a big cartoon I did for an exhibit of my work at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle in about 2005. And it, it just sort of captured what I, how I see myself as this astronaut in this crazy universe. Uh, these are all the presidents up to that point who I had done cartoons about. Um, and this was done the old fashioned way. This is like, um, ink and paper and, um, and, and watercolor. And, and so I want, I want to start off with two, two stories about my beginning days at the Seattle Post Intelligencer. The, the first one, um, I'd been at the Journal American in Bellevue, and got offered a job at the, the PI, and this was 1979. And I took a break in between and went to Europe. And it turned out that while I was there, um, I, I knew, I, found this out before I went over, that, that uh, President Jimmy Carter and uh, Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev were meeting in Vienna for the strategic arms limitation talks. And I thought, well, that would be a cool way to start my career at this uh, you know, big city newspaper. I will write them some dispatches from there. And so I, I convinced the editor of the PI that would be a cool, great idea. So I went over there and um, kind of 
got as close to it all as I could, and then I went to the United Press International office, typed out several stories on a German typewriter, which I discovered has the letters in very different places. <laughs> so it was like, talk about hunt and peck. It was, yeah. Um, anyway, sent those off, and I thought, this is so cool. I'm, I'm going to arrive at the PI as you know, a, a foreign correspondent. Um, anyway, I did arrive at PI after my trip to Europe, and they said, where, were, where are the stories? <laughs> you said you were going to send some stories. And I said, I sent them. And, it, and so they did get sent from the UPI office in Vienna to the UPI office in the post-intelligence or building in Seattle. But that was on the third floor, and nobody ever got it down to the second floor newsroom. So that was my first experience with the uh, inadequacy of old technology. Uh, the second one was a year later, I was at the Democratic Convention in New York um, in 1980. This is when uh, Teddy Kennedy challenged uh, Jimmy Carter for the nomination. There was a n this whole new way to deliver cartoons that, that had just begun then. It was called FedEx. <laughs> It seemed amazing, because there was no real good way to send a, a, a quality uh, cartoon that kind of distance, 3,000 miles. But so anyway, I did a, a full page of cartoons on the uh, next to last day of the convention, delivered to, to FedEx, and it was supposed to be there the next day, and they would put it in the newspaper. And uh, anyway, got all my work done, and I proceeded to go party all night. And the next morning, I got a phone call from my editor saying, just like, where's the story from Vienna? Where are the cartoons? And uh, it's the only th th time I've ever not had something delivered by FedEx. So in my very hungover state, I had to redraw the whole page. Um, so technology used to kind of get in the way of, especially what I do, because it, it's not like sending words. Sending images, is, is, it was a tougher, tougher thing. But um, luckily for me, that's changed. Um, last year, just a little over a year ago, I was in Selma, Alabama, um, and this was the 50th anniversary of the uh, uh, Bloody Sunday March um, over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, a big event, uh, President uh, Obama was there, gave an amazing speech, and I was there to, to observe it. But I was also there, actually, with a, a group of... Uh, there's me in the crowd. Um, I was traveling with a group of students from the University of Washington uh, Communication Department and uh, kids from uh, Bellevue College and from Colorado State University. And we were on a civil rights tour. So I was sort of a men mentor with them through this trip. And I'd made all these promises to the LA Times about what I was going to produce. And once I got there, I realized I'm kind of busy. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, working with the students. We were on a bus every day for hours, moving, meeting uh, heroes of the civil rights movement, and I, I realized this is going to be a problem. I don't, because uh, there's production time involved with cartoons, and I didn't have the time. So, in, in one way, I kind of went old school. I just, I just did instant drawings from wherever I was. This is how they came out. Uh, just in a notebook, and all I did was take a picture of it with my phone and sent it, and it was great. No problem. Didn't get lost anywhere. It was published within minutes online of when I sent it off. So that, uh, that that's, that's a plus for the new world. Um, a more recent experience last summer, well, I guess it was last fall, the first Democratic debate in Las Vegas. I was there for the LA Times. And again, I was, I was drawing cartoons real time. I did this cartoon while sitting, listening to the bit, debate, scanned it into my computer, and with almost, be, almost literally before the ink was dry, it was published in LATimes.com. You know, it, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful uh, world where technology works with you instead of against you. Yeah. You can, you'll have to read these to yourself. I can't really see them very well over here. And then, um, very recently, uh, about two weeks ago, I was in Phoenix just before the, the primary there, following this guy around. 
You may recognize him. And my job was to, uh, this was a special project that actually is coming out in Sunday's LA Times. And um, I, my job was to go talk, not, not to really pay that much attention to Trump, but to the people supporting Trump. To get in there, talk to them, um, see what they had to say, basically ask why. <laughs> um, but not in that voice, even though that was the voice in my head. It was like, so why do you like this guy? Um, and so they, they told me these things, and I, uh, so I did a, I've got a series of caricatures I did of the people with little vignettes about what they had to say. This one, w w woman was one of my favorites because her main reason was she thinks she has a nice down-to-earth family. <laughs> and I'm not sure. <laughs> if, I don't know if she's seen his wife or not, but um, anyway, uh, again, this is, a fun project that was ina has, is, has been enabled by technology because uh, we've spent the last few days figuring out how to configure it best to look good on a, tel on a telephone, on a pad, on your computer, as well as in print. Um, so the, the, the possibilities of what you can do, especially in what I do, uh, what I've done for years in, in my corner of journalism, are, have really been expanded by technology. Um, now, this all started <laughs> back in college at that little school in Seattle. Um, oh, wait, oh, I'm sorry, I had one more thing here. Forgot. And then there's this. So my parents say relationships take time, but I like to make things happen right here, right now. That's why I love this new dating app political Tinder. So let's see who's out there. Looks like the manager at Taco Bell. <laughs> okay, Stony McBong hit. Oh, look at the baby face. Grandpa? Creepy. Creepier. Not so sure I'm into girls. But maybe after a couple of drinks. Nope. Negative. Oh, hell no. He'd have to be rich to get away with hair like that. I'm thinking yes. Where are the boyfriends? What are they? Mexicans? Chinese? They're weak. Losers. I'd be a tremendous boyfriend. Women love me. And you know why? Because I'm rich. I'm really rich. I don't even know how much. Are you f***ing kidding me? I should just listen to my parents. A really great wall. Better than the Chinese. With a beautiful doorway. You know, a gold door, marble, and a bouncer at the door. A big guy. I know somebody. And he'll keep out so, the rapists and the drug pushers <laughs> and only let in the good. I've always wanted to do animation, but up until recently, it was just no way. You know, too much money, too much time, too much everything. Uh, but Trishan and I put that together just in, over a couple of days. And, you know, it's not elaborate animation, but in the past that would have been... Not only would it have been a lot of work and expensive to do, um, before online newspapers, I don't know where I would have run it. it wouldn't have gone in a print newspaper and um, probably not on, you know, I'd have to work for TV and I'm not sure they'd let me use the F word like I did. Um, <laughs> but, so anyway, it, things have really changed for me in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, I think. Um, and it's amazing that I forgot I was going to show you that. <laughs> I, I want to thank the AV crew for making this happen. Yeah, these guys are great. Okay, but this all started um, here. That's me uh, at the University of Washington Daily. That's my girlfriend. We were really cool dressers. <laughs> we knew we were like total fashion. Um, <clears throat> When I started at the University of Washington, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. I, I, I liked drawing cartoons, I liked writing, I liked history, I liked politics, but I didn't know how to pull it all together until I started working on the student paper and, and started spending all my time there and um, eventually became editor. There I am with really cool hair and love beads. <clears throat> this was the mid-70s. And I, I suddenly, in this process, discovered Journalism was in my chromosomes. 
I mean, I, it just, this pulled everything together for me. This is all I wanted to do. And luckily I had this very unusual kind of uh, talent that I could use uh, in journalism in a, in a, in a special way. Uh, so I went on from there to, uh, I, I worked as an intern reporter in Olympia, which was a great experience. And you can see my, with those plaid pants, I'm still a cool dresser. And those experiences got me to the Journal American, which at the time was a new, new uh, newspaper, new daily newspaper in Bellevue, Washington. I met great people like Bruce um, and uh, Jimmy Carter. This, this is actually 19, about 1980. Um, it was my first uh, White House press conference with, uh, and you know, I was right out of college, still had really good looking hair. Um, And then I started at the PI. I already told you how I started exactly, but I ended up being there for amazingly 30 years, which <laughs> time flies. Um, and uh, most of that time working as a, a, a cartoonist, also doing a lot of writing uh, in the process. The, 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 the drawing I'm working on right there was a project I did, uh, went to, uh, I went to Japan with one of our reporters for two weeks and, produced uh, uh, a series of cartoons about changes in Japanese society. And the PI, you know, was like the number two paper forever. And every, you know, the day I walked in there, they said it was going out of business, but had ambitions way beyond. And I uh, was able to take advantage of that and do a lot of fun things. Um, and of course, I spent a lot of time drawing presidents. Uh, sure, I'll testify before Ken Starr, but only in a manner that Say? Does some, preserves the dignity of the presidency, something like that. This is actually one of the cartoons in the group of cartoons that uh, won me a Pulitzer in 1999. So I thank uh, Monica Lewinsky for that. <laughs> this is our celebration at the PI when we got the, I was just getting the phone call about it. And then another president uh, was kind enough to pro provide me m material for a second Pulitzer in 2003, um, President Bush. Let's see, can I? Oh, yeah, there we go. All right. I got to read this to you. Mr. President, what should be done with any budget surplus? Tax cuts for the wealthy. Mr. President, what if the surplus is gone? Tax cuts for the wealthy. Mr. President, how do we stimulate the economy? Tax cuts for the wealthy. Mr. President, how can we deal with job losses? Tax cuts for the wealthy. Mr. President, what if the fan belt goes out on my 95 Toyota? Tax cuts for the. Okay, who's the wise guy? So, um,. Actually, that's still the Republican platform, if you know. Uh, so, and, and as I said, I, I was able to do a lot of cool projects. This is, this is from a series of cartoons and columns that I did during, for, during the uh, Lewis and Clark uh, Bicentennial in 2005. And I started at the Continental Divide and went to the ocean, and along the way, just tried to <clears throat> put myself into the experience of Lewis and Clark. I went river rafting. I rode a horse through the forest. Uh, I went to a, 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 a tribal meeting of the Nez Perce tribe. Uh, great, fun trip. Um, that was only topped by this one in 2008 where I was sent uh, through six different western states uh, during the presidential primaries and just looking for kind of vignettes that would say something about the, the, the state of the union in, in, in that, that election. And amazingly, they ran on the front page. The PI was so indulgent. Um, so having I had a you know, fantastic career there, they uh, sent me to Washington, D.C. in 1995-96. That's my family. Um, and I worked in the Hearst Newspapers Bureau there. And then again in 2009, I went back to the Hearst Bureau, ran into this guy on the street. Um, he, he's a high school friend of mine. I, I'm not sure what he's doing now. Uh, Jay Inslee? Yeah. Anyway, he actually, I did go to high school with Jay. And so I was having another fantastic time in Washington, D.C. during the first 100 days of the Obama presidency when calamity struck. 
One that I should have seen coming, but uh, still was a surprise. And that was the end of the print PI. And this is the last cartoon I drew for the PI, um, celebrating its storied history. And so there, this was <laughs> a crisis moment for me, uh, even more for um, all my colleagues, most of whom were let go. I was kept on in the new creation, uh, seattlepi.com. It was it's Hearst's um, experiment, seeing if you could have a, a, a daily newspaper that's totally online in, in a major city like Seattle. Um, so it was interesting being part of the experiment, but wasn't exactly what I wanted, and I wasn't sure it was going to really work, because that especially seemed like a crazy time for newspapers, for the newspaper business. I did this cartoon at the time, and with the most famous newspaper man ever, Superman, Clark Kent. Dude, uh, so that's Perry White coming out saying, due to the big losses we've suffered, the Daily Planet is being sold to Lex Luthor, and he's laying off everyone but Jimmy Olsen. So Clark says, Lois, I've got to save the newspaper industry. Ah, uh, just give it up, Clark, and start a blog. <laughs> so every, yeah, a lot of my friends were starting blogs, and I thought, I don't think that's, that's the most lucrative way to go. <laughs> it's funny. Um, so I, you know, what was I to do but, you know, just grow my hair? Um, <laughs> or not. Actually, I, I started at that point, I'd been kind of resisting, you know, tweeting and the whole online world. I just thought, no, I like doing what I do. And, uh, but I thought, maybe it's time to start embracing it. So I actually, um, besides working with LA, uh, PI, seattlepi.com, I did a project, uh, uh, several projects for msnbc.com. And this is actually from one of those. I'm going to show you just a short clip. I did a series of uh, five the kind of travel stories, but kind of quirky lifestyle stories that I did with a photographer. And what's fun about it was th there's a cartoon segment in it that uh, I did for each of these. I also did the narration, wrote the thing, did interviews. Um, so it was like bursting into the multimedia world in a, a cool way. And uh, we'll just give you a quick look at a little bit of that. The boardwalk at Venice Beach, California, is famous as one of America's most bizarre and bohemian scenes. But the real shocker is that right here, amid the tattoo artists, fortune tellers, and homeless people on rollerblades, I found an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. It's the Pacific Jewish Center, also known as the Shul on the Beach. On the eve of the Purim holiday, I stepped in from the boardwalk and entered a radically different scene. Males and females were seated on separate sides of a partition. I took a seat among the men and began to listen to an old, old story being read in Hebrew. Then I noticed something truly odd. Everyone was dressed in costume. This, as I was to learn, was inspired by the story being read, the story of Esther. Esther was a lovely young woman in ancient Persia who so enraptured the king that he made her his queen without knowing she had a secret. The king's chief advisor, a guy named Haman, hated the Jews and was plotting to exterminate them. Esther found out about Haman's plan, so she went to the king and revealed what she had been hiding. She was Jewish. In the end, the king spared the Jews, and Haman got what was coming to him. The synagogue's young rabbi, Eliyahu Fink, told me the tradition of wearing costumes on Purim reflects not just Esther's hidden identity, but the story's many hidden meanings and reversals of fate. We were supposed to be destroyed, and instead we were able to protect ourselves. So it's kind of like an opposite day. It really shows how things are hidden, and we don't know what's going to happen. And that's really the, thing, the idea behind a costume. So here's my Next hair. Day was the big Purim party to celebrate this tale of Jewish survival. Costumes again were in order, and this time I wanted to fit in by hiding my real identity. As it turned out, I fit in perfectly with the boardwalk crowd. Okay. So anyway, so th that kind of I actually almost took a job with MSNBC.com, um, which 
might have been a good move. Uh, but because I was looking for something new, something that I could expand what I do, uh, employ all this new technology. And uh, instead, I ended up here. Uh, this is the LA Times. And enter, got, got into the LA Times in an odd way, because they were in a, like most newspapers, they were in a layoff mode. Um, and the editor wanted to hire me, but he said, I can't just, you know, I don't have money, and I don't want to hire you while I'm firing other people. But he said, give me time. So there was a fellow there doing a political blog called Top of the Ticket. And he left, and so Russ Stanton, the editor of the Times, called me and said, you want to take this over? Just do whatever you want with it. Um, just do cartoons, write, whatever. Um, I was happy to do that. So this is, this is what I do most days. Um, uh, you can find it online. I, I, I do a, a column and a cartoon, and it's about three times the work I've <laughs> ever done. So I, somehow I, I worked my way into doing a lot more work, but it's totally fun. Um, and being in, in LA, I also get to uh, the opportunity to do Hollywood stuff. I, uh, this is a page of cartoons I did about the, the, this year's Oscars and the controversy about uh, Oscars so white. And, um, but my main thing, my main assignment there is national politics. And so, of course, I feel exceedingly lucky to be involved in, have a front row seat in the insane campaign that we're going through right now. So. I want to show you a few cartoons that I've done over the last year. Um, now, this is this is from about a year, maybe a little over a year ago. It, when when this started, we everybody figured this is going to be a campaign like many others. It'll be all about candidates uh, competing to get donors uh, b money from big donors. And um, when Mitt Romney Romney dropped out or said he wasn't running, there really was a scramble by some of the major. Uh, Republican candidates to to get the money he would have gotten himself. So I picture it as I'm always looking for an analogy, uh, uh, an image that will to will capture the point of what I'm trying to make. And somehow I just imagine these guys as milkmaids. Um, the, on the Democratic side, it seemed like everything was obviously already figured out that it would be Hillary, um, and that everyone would be going after her immediately because she's been a target for about 20 years. I'm running. Take your best shot. Um, but as it turned out, wait. Oh, I know. OK, sorry. As it turned out, of course, it's been a little different. Um, the Republican field got crowded fast when uh, Donald Trump jumped in. Um, this is like the first cartoon I did of, of, of that. And, and looking back, I'm, I don't, I was really right. <laughs> I mean, drawing him as this presence that would just crowd out everybody else. I, I'm not sure um, how I was that smart, but uh, it, it's sort of been the story of the year. Um, Jeb Bush said, you know, uh, almost literally what he says here, Donald Trump does not re represent the values of the Republican Party. It's like. Says who? So I drew all these characters looking like Trump. You know, the Tea Party, the birthers, Mexicans go home, rich guys. He looks exactly like the Republican Party. Um, and Jeb obviously was not a good predictor of how things would come out. Uh, in fact, people were, at least some voters, were looking for something a little different this year. They were looking for an alpha male to, to, to dominate, to take over, to to be the, the kind of warrior leader, um, this guy's saying, but he's so crude, inarticulate, simplistic. This crowd isn't into nuance. And you, you notice uh, Ann Coulter there being dragged away. Yeah. Um, now, on the Democratic side, it also didn't turn out exactly as, as expected. There was this gentleman from Vermont who uh, suddenly caught on. I mean, who knew that this guy in his 70s, kind of stooped over, old radical, would become the darling of all you young people. I mean, it, 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 uh, that was almost as unpredictable as Donald Trump. 
But uh, here's this nice American family driving by saying, look at the avowed socialist, Bernie Sanders, trying to look like a real American. But anyway, a little Vermont country store there. Um, so Hillary found that rather than being all alone, she, it was kind of a crowded stage. I was told I would have this stage to myself. Um, her, her biggest worry for a while was the guy over there in the wings, uh, Vice President Biden, who um, she thought would have been her biggest threat. Didn't work out that way. But uh, she actually was lucky in the guy who did become her rival. Um, Bernie famously, in, in I think it was the first debate, you know, said he didn't give a damn about her emails. He wanted to talk about real issues. And that was a very kind thing of him to do. It's been a very, the Democrats have had a very sort of civilized debate. Um, meanwhile, on the other side, it's been kind of a pig pile. Um, what's he saying? We all agree on two things. Government sucks and the liberal media sucks. And apparently facts suck. So. But I, it was, now as a cartoonist, it was quite a challenge when there were 17 candidates on the Republican side. That's a lot of drawing. So I, I don't think I ever drew all of them, but I got most of them, or the main ones in this one. Um, <clears throat> now, th this is one I've got to really read to you. The first Republican debate really gave a sense of how this was all going to go. Up to that point, it's like Trump was still sort of a joke. I mean, well, I mean, no one really expected him to do much. Um, and there were still expectations that money would end up driving the election, and one of these sort of mainline governors would be the can, uh, you know the nominee. The, but the, the 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 debate in early August showed that this was going to be a whole different kind of thing. So I portrayed it as a 10-round uh, boxing match. Round one, Megyn Kelly slaps Trump for, for trash-talking women. Round two, Paul, Paul, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, Rand Paul and Trump get into a clinch over the Clintons. Round three, Kasich lands a punch on Kelly. Round four, Bush stands around nervously smiling. <laughs> Round five, Christie and Paul give each other wedgies. <laughs> Round six, Trump hammers referee Chris Wallace. <laughs> Round seven, dancing around the ring, Rubio's untouched. Round eight, saying I'm a different kind of Republican, Paul moons the crowd. Round nine, Walker mentions his Harley, thinking he landed a knockout. He was my least favorite guy, actually. Uh, round 10, everyone gangs up on Planned Parenthood. So I, 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 pretty much, I think I pretty much captured the whole thing, and it's only gotten weirder since. <clears throat> um, now, when, once people actually started, well, oh, oh I know, before we get to this, the, I think the story that, the, uh, the entire news establishment missed. Not a, it wasn't just tr uh, underestimating Trump, but not recognizing that what was really driving Trump was uh, a very strange mood in a big part of the electorate. And I, 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 th I think I tried to capture it in this. It's called Walls. I still don't feel safe. Maybe I need a lid. You know, these people who, there's a, a lot of people who are angry, scared, just up. Just ha they've had it with, uh, with the system as it is, and uh, the, the folks I talked to, for instance, you know, uh, in, in Phoenix, that was their theme. Anybody but just a regular politician, because we're mad as hell and we want to build walls. Uh, and it, we all came late to that story. Um, when we started, once voting started, it became apparent there were a lot of people out there ready to vote for this guy. Uh, yeah, this is Trump making his mark in New Hampshire. Now, I thought this was kind of an edgy cartoon. You don't really have people relieving themselves in family newspapers. But um, actually, this was nothing compared with the real campaign. Uh, so I eventually got to this state, where they were talking about the size of their hands and other things. And I said, this is like, it's like, uh, like a middle school. The, the, the next debate should be in mil at a middle school shower room. Uh, Rubio saying, ha, I knew, I knew it wasn't just your hands that are small. And Trump says, well, I can see another reason to call you little Marco. Um, 
meanwhile, over at the Democratic side, um, wait, I may or may not be, oh no, sorry, I'm not there yet. So we were, we were left with two big questions of the, the election coming up. Assuming Trump actually gets the nomination, will America end up like this? Or will he just be, you know, if he, he's president, uh, just sort of a, an embarrassment, not a danger, although the sort of embarrassment he could be. Now, I don't want to sound partisan here. If, I, I, mean, I know there are a lot of Trump supporters here. This is just me objectively speaking. <laughs> anyway, I drew this cartoon sort of, what if? What if he's as bad as some people think? So, and that, that's the big question. If he indeed is the nominee, if he should win the presidency, just, you know, he is the most, it, it's really hard to predict where he's going to end up. Meanwhile, uh, on the Democratic side, the question is, assuming Hillary gets the nomination, will she be able to, you know, borrow that energy, uh, especially uh, among young people, um, that Bernie has? And uh, I pictured that this way. She's kind of a mom. Uh, girls, when you get done m mooning over a guy who is way too old for you, I could use a little help. God, she sounds just like, like my mother. So that's, that's her challenge to get past. Um, in, a, in some ways, the big story of this election has been the way that Trump has played the media like a bagpipe. Um, it's, in, in, you know, arguably, it's technology has enabled him. Um, not only his tweets late at night about uh, other candidates' wives, but um, his ability to grab the attention of, especially cable news media. Um, a reporter for the Rolling Stone said he discovered the secret that that uh, that the cable news media is distract is eminently eminently it is hugely distractible by any train wreck that happens. Um, they just can't not look at what Trump, Trump does. So he's been able to dominate the media in a, a way that no candidate ever has. Um, he's also benefited from the, the way technology has put us all in silos. You know, you can, you, we now can easily sequester ourselves only in, in a like-minded world where we only hear opinions with which we agree, only hear from news uh, providers who uh, give us what we want to hear. And I, I saw an example of that actually in Arizona. This was, a, a, this was a Ted Cruz rally, which was advertised as a Ted Cruz rally. All these voters showed up. It turned out to be a Sean Hannity show for Fox. I thought, this is really curious. This guy um, devoted his whole show to essentially a free ad for Ted Cruz. Um, and he preceded it by coming out and making fun of all the media people there. Um, and I thought, well, I think that's okay. I'm glad he doesn't think he's part of the media because he's, he's really not. But he has the tools of the media. It's, it's just the sort of thing that wouldn't have happened in other elections. It, it shows how th things have shifted in weird ways. Anyway, it's, you know, the worse things are for the world, the better they are for political cartoonists. Um, finally, oh, uh, this is an example of th that siloing. This is a couple I met at the Trump rally, Shane and Rachel Farley. Really, really nice people. Um, but they told me that they, get, they don't get their news from CNN or Fox or any mainstream outlet. They get it all from something called InfoWars. And does anyone know what InfoWars is? Anyway, it's it's a uh, it's 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 kind of a it's an online uh, newscast done by a guy, guy named Alec Jones. If you remember, a few months ago there was this brouhaha in the, in Texas because uh, there was going to be a, a military uh, um, training exercises in the Southwest, and the governor, the people, the number of people in Texas got riled up because there were all these rumors that that this was a, an attempt to overthrow the legitimate government of Texas and take it over. And so, someone pointed out that actually Texas is part of the United States, so, but 
Anyway, that came from this guy, Alex Jones. So anyway, these nice people get all their information from this guy. And it's, it's a weird kind of dynamic that is playing out in this e the election because you get a lot of people getting their news, getting their news, information from strange places. And who knows, it may end up with Trump in the White House. Um, this is when that 3, 3 a.m. call comes to President Trump. Shouldn't you answer that? Not now, I'm tweeting a photo of Putin's fat girlfriend. But this cartoon, actually, I did, finished up last night after drinking bourbon with your dean. Um, and again, was released to the world um, within minutes after that and while I was sleeping. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of amazing to think, you know, I started with those problems I had in the old days, trying to get my cartoon just to go to the Seattle to appear in a print newspaper that would be wrap, wrapping fish the next day. Now, literally anyone in the world that has a cell phone could see this cartoon uh, right now. And they can see it tomorrow and the next day. It doesn't go away. It's, it's, it's out there. It's, there's actually kind of more permanence in this electronic thing than, than there used to be in, in the print product. So um, I, I'm, I, I wanted to basically leave you students in particular with kind of a, a happy thought. Because, <laughs> um, you know, times are tough in the world of journalism. Um, the, 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 the whole business model has been destroyed by technology. Um, in some ways, we're being helped along by new technology, but no one has quite figured out how to make money with it. The, uh, we recently, we, we celebrated at the LA Times that in February, we had 55 million unique visitors to latimes.com. That's an amazing number. Um, but still, the, the, the print product, which goes to less than a million people, carries all the weight, makes all the money. And no one's figured out how to, how to make money to keep the whole thing going, even with all those possible eyes on, on the news product. But as someone who, who, who uh, does a form of opinion journalism that really hasn't changed much in 250 years um, and still does it in a way that Thomas Nast and other cartoonists did in the 19th century. Um, I'm nevertheless encouraged because what I do now can go much farther than, than, those, than old technology allowed my cartoons to go and much faster. And even though this brave new world of journalism isn't entirely comfortable, um, it, and the financial base for it all is frighteningly fragile, and though a lot of people have lost their jobs, and more certainly will, and though the audience is fractured, and the product is often ignored, and often, even more often distrusted, um, the young people I work with at the LA Times, you know, 28, 29, 30 years old, working new media in, in uh, social media. They're as excited as I was 40 years ago in the Woodward and Bernstein era. I mean, they don't know and don't really care what the good old days were like, because right now they're having a great time. Um, they are involved in, in the process of figuring out how to make this all work for the future. They're inventing the new journalism. And I just, as a senior member of the staff, I'm just really grateful myself to be working with them and to be part of that same thing. Um, it's, it's a scary but also exciting time to be part of uh, American journalism. That's my message. So thank you very much. We do, have we do have time to take a few questions, if anybody has questions for David. College of Communication, journalists, <laughs> questions. Come on, guys. <laughs> I guess I answered well, all of them. I guess so. Yeah. Let you me have a question for me? <laughs> <laughs>
what, what does a cartoonist look like 20 years from now? Well, this cartoon is <laughs> pretty old. <but laughs> Let's say well, the cartoon. Yeah, we yeah, don't want it to yeah. think about you. Well, you know, in some ways, there, there are a lot of young cartoonists basically inventing what it will be like right now. It, it's both a best, worst of times and best of times thing for cartooning. There are a lot fewer jobs like I have on the staff of a newspaper. Uh, so it's, but there are also a lot more uh, opportunities online to do different kinds of uh, political and social commentary. There are cartoonists who are going, young, young cartoonists going out and covering stories and then, then reporting on them in visually. Um, so I think between that expanded definition of what it is to be a, a newspaper or an editorial cartoonist and all the technological innovations that, yeah, in 20 years, it'll be a, a great job. You might not get paid, but it'll be a great job. <laughs> yes. Wow. Um, the question was, over my long career, have I ever done, uh, do I have a favorite cartoon? I, you know, I get that question a lot, and, um, it, it's really hard. I, I, have my, I have new favorites all the time. Although I must say, the one that always pops into my head when I'm asked that question, I don't know if it's my favorite or not, but in some ways it's the most successful one I did, ever did. And it was early on in my years at the PI. It was, a, it was a map of the world. It was called The World According to Ronald Reagan. It was I imagined his, if he was drawing a map of the world, what it would be like. It, it was all this goofy stuff. Um, I think this part of the world was called Ecotopia, and it was all tree huggers. And, um, but anyway, that was a very popular cartoon when it ran in the paper. Uh, then I produced it as a poster, which sold worldwide. In fact, a friend of mine, Tim Egan, who worked, write, writes for the New York Times, went on a mountain climbing trip to Mount Kilimanjaro, came down, and in some little like hut-like bar at the base of the mountain, my cartoon was on the wall. I mean, it's crazy. It was also redone in uh, Pravda. Um, so probably, I guess that's it. I'll claim that. Because otherwise, it's like I, I periodically have new favorites. Yeah. Well, 2008 was, and that's a good question. Uh, 2008, I really enjoyed. I, part of it is because I did that project going through the Western states. But I found it to be a very inspiring election. Um, you know, it was both the, the, the battle between uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama was, uh, you know, this, either way it was going to be a s historic moment. Um, I, I found John McCain a, a, to be a really decent heroic guy, um, and then his choice of Sarah Palin just topped it all. Uh, <laughs> but I, this, this year is in competing with that one in, in almost a negative way. I don't find anything inspiring about this one, but boy, is it fascinating. Yeah, I, there was one other hand. Oh. Yeah. How do I approach fairness or balance? I, I think, yeah. I think already answered that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, luckily, because I, I'm an, an opinion journalist. I mean, I, so my job is not necessarily to be balanced. Well, it is not. It. I mean, a political cartoonist, that's not your job. Your job is to basically stir up trouble, to, to, to stir up debate. It's like to say, this is what I think. What do you think? It, um, and so I just, I'm just, I'm free to call it as I see it, and then let readers respond. Um, but I, I mean, fairness still counts. You know, I, I, I try to. You know, every cartoon I do, I, I want to be able to. You know, I, I'm not just randomly attacking someone or making fun of them because they look funny or something. It's, it's because I've studied the issues and, and, and uh, looked at what's going on in the news, and this is the conclusion I've come to. It's like writing an editorial. You know, er editorials aren't uh, unbiased. It's, it's, it's an opinion that people can respond to. It, it's always been a, an important part of, of newspapers. Um, but 
yeah, there's still, there's a responsibility there it's, it, it, and that I'm very aware of. And plus, I try to think, you know, I don't want to be one note either. You know, I, I want to change it up. I don't want people to be totally, I don't want to be totally predictable. Um, but yeah, opinion journalism is kind of a, a, a different, different animal. Yeah. Okay, you guys t get together, figure out which, no. <laughs> yes. Well, it goes back to what I just said. He asked, he noted, I mean, this is not entirely representative of everything I've done. Uh, he noted that I'm doing a lot more Republicans than Democrats. Part of that is that they've been a much more interesting subject. I mean, really, the, most of the news coverage everywhere has been heavily toward Republicans just because it's a, a bigger fight. Um, but, yeah, back to what I said, in terms of balance or, or being neutral, I'm, I, I'm only neutral in the sense that I'm trying to call it as I see it. I'm not supporting one side or the other, but if I come to the conclusion that this guy's crazy and this other person is not, I will point out this person's crazy. It, 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 if your choices are between bad and good or whatever, um, I'm allowed to take sides. Can I, can I take one last here from Paul? The cartoon that caused the most outrage. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, I know what it was. Yes, this is goofy. You think, okay, I'm making fun of all these important people all the time. Probably the most outrage I ever got was when I first started at the PI. And just south of Seattle, there's a city called Tacoma. And they were building a new dome there for sports events. And so I basically did a joke about Tacoma. I, I, I imagined what the dome was going to look like. It had a smokestack coming out of it and it had a marquee saying wrestling, topless dancing. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it was just a little smart, smarty pants Seattle guy saying, you know, poking Tacoma in the eye, which was kind of unfair. But anyway, we got inundated. The, the, Editor spent the whole day taking phone calls from outra outraged Tacomans. We ran an entire page of letters to saying what an idiot I was. And yeah, it was a good lesson. <laughs> I mean, the lesson was, and it kind of goes back to all that, that I want to be, every cartoon I do, I want to be able to defend and say, okay, I may be wrong, but I, I think this is why I, I said this about this event. And I actually, I probably couldn't defend that one too well. But that was funny. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, uh, we have a little... We have a goodie bag, we have a goodie bag of stuff for him, right. uh, but we can go through that later. Uh, but one thing we do have in particular is a, is a Murrow jacket, and that was the cougar gold that just went rolling <laughs> down at my feet. A Murrow jacket for you. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. So when I go to... When I go to my next meeting as a member of the uh, board of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington, oh, I'll wear this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, take your, your goodie bag, right. your cheese. Thank you. <laughs> and there'll be some more bourbon later, okay? <laughs> um, none of this would have been possible with, without lots of people. First of all, of course, our sponsors, long-standing investment in the Murrow Symposium, Jack and Jan Creighton, and Paul Casey and his wife, Marty K Richardson Casey, who have been longtime supporters. <laughs> and Paul's company, Casey Communication. Our platinum partners, Chateau Saint-Michel, and we'll be sampling their wares in the back of the bar in a few minutes. Uh, the Lewiston Tribune and the uh, Moscow Pullman Daily News. Our Crimson Partners, King 5 and Northwest Cable News. And our Silver Partners, Tim and Karen P Pavish. Tim, are you in the back somewhere? There. 
Thanks so much for all of your support. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm, I'm stepping down as dean. Uh, I've been dean for the last seven years, most of you know. Um, let me indulge me in, in just a couple of things. First of all, when I was approached seven years ago and asked if I was interested in the possibility of being dean of the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication, um, I took a breath. Um, as many of you know, I'm a former CBS correspondent, and as, as John and Kay will tell you, Murrow was alive, particularly in those days, Murrow was alive in the halls of CBS. And we joked about the two degrees of separation along with Kay, that two degrees of separation. I was privileged to have my college journal, TV journalism professor was Murrow's chief writer, Ed Bliss. And I got to know Larry Lesur, one of the original Murrow boys when I was covering the Hill. So it was very moving for me to take on this position. And it's been a phenomenal seven years. Uh, but it's been a seven years that so many other people have contributed to. Uh, we have more than 100 faculty and staff in the college these days, so I can't even begin to thank everyone. Uh, but let me single out a few people who run various sections of the college and have contributed with their teams to making all of this possible. Uh, first of all, Dina Penton, my assistant for the last several years. Dina, where are you? You've well, she's not here, she's, she's abandoned me. No, she's out there working is what she's doing. Dina has kept the, the dean's office running um, just at like a clockwork speed, and she and Sandy Johnson also in the front office. All of the others in the front office have been so important to me. Um, Denise Blacker, Denise, are you here? Our, our chief financial officer and her team in the business office. Again, I can't name everyone in the business office. Sarah Stout, who really embarrassingly last night at the reception and referred to as Sandy, I guess it's age, but Sarah Stout, are you here? Sarah runs, there she is in the back with, with Lisa Lauder, Laughter, who, uh, and excuse me, but she did change her name a year or two ago from Lauder to Laughter, so I still stumble on that. But, and their team in the, in the student services office, they've built our Pathways to Murrow program over the last few years. All of you who are students know how important they are. Um, Darren Watkins, our, our head of communications. Darren, where are you in the back? Who, who, you know, all the printed stuff you see, all of our external communication are thanks to Darren. Jeff Snell and his team in IT. Jeff, are you here? They keep the, the, uh, the equipment running, keep us communicating electronically. Uh, Connolly Roden uh, and the rest of the team in television, who, as you see, do a phenomenal job. Jeff, and then on the academic side, Jeff Peterson, our, our uh, head of uh, academic uh, affairs. Jeff, are you here? I guess not. Um, and the, the unit heads, uh, Doug Hindman, who's the head, the chair of our journalism sequence, Stacy Huss, the head of our uh, strategic communication sequence, Todd Norton, the head of our communication and society sequence, who is also leaving the college, unfortunately. Uh, Rebecca Cooney, who's been running our online masters in Stratcom for the last couple of years. Brett Atwood, who runs Everett, and. Uh, and, and Nanu Iyer, I know Nanu was here, or he may have headed for the airport who runs Vancouver. And then there's many others in the leadership group. Can I ask everyone in the faculty to stand up, please? All of our faculty members. All of, and all of our staff members who are here, please. Staff members. Over in the corner, standing in the shadows, is Marvin Marcello, who or, or headed the team that put this whole thing together today, is our general manager of broadcast. He and Kerry Swanson have grown our broadcast properties. There are you know, just so many people that I am so grateful for. Um, as many of you know, I'm going to step away, step off stage left now, take a year, go back to uh, committing journalism, as, as we say in the business, doing a book on Islam and American politics. and. Like, like David, I've got lots of material to work with uh, in the next uh, six months or so. Um, but it has truly been an honor 
and I will always, and Carol Kowalski, I don't know, you were on my list and I skipped you. Carol, who, who headed our development team, who, who led us, I knew I was going to miss somebody, who led us to, to raising $45 million in our campaign in the last couple of years, in the last seven years. Um, I'm sure I missed some other people, but thanks to all of you. And, you know, I will, no matter what I do, I will always be proud to say that I was the founding dean of the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication. And Bruce, Bruce Pinkleton, your next dean. Thank you so much.